the cloud. All right, we are live. We are live, live, live. Welcome, everybody. I am going to start the webinar and grab everyone here that is waiting in the waiting room. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We should have a good amount of attendees coming here to our In Our Own Voice presentation because we have about 57 people that have RSVP'd. And that is a really, really great amount of people to come. And we are excited to welcome everybody. This is a monthly um, presentation that we do. It's one of our signature programs with NAMI Orange County in our own voice. I'll get into the introduction to let everybody know what this is all about as we welcome everybody in. I uh, just sent out an email to everybody just so that they have the uh, link if they didn't get it in their invitation. So we're we're excited that we're all here. We have two wonderful presenters, and I'm going to go ahead and get into our introduction before we start um, going into their presentation. I just have a quick introduction. So welcome, everybody, again to NAMI Orange County In Our Own Voice presentation today with Daniel Shoemaker and Kimberly Hernandez. Now, I'm a program coordinator with NAMI Orange County. I've been with NAMI for going on three years now, but before I introduce our speakers, I uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of what we're here for, what we're doing, um, and also a little bit on NAMI's organization. The National Alliance on Mental Illness is a United States-based advocacy group originated, originally founded as a grassroots group of family members of diet people diagnosed with mental illness. NAMI identifies its mission as being dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by mental illness. And NAMI Orange County also is an affiliate of NAMI National, which is based in Virginia. And we also focus on education, support, and advocacy of those in the mental health community. We have classes, we have programming, and we also have, uh, we do advocacy locally and through NAMI California, through our state as well. So we um, are very involved in our community. And this is one of the things that we do if you want more information on NAMI, uh, you can find our website at namioc.org, namioc.org. Um, we have all of our resources out there and everything that we do is free to the public. So what are we here here? What are we here for? This is uh, NAMI in our own voice. The goal of the presentation is to change attitudes, assumptions, and ideas about people with mental health conditions. These presentations provide a personal perspective of mental health conditions as leaders with lived experience talk openly about what it's like to have a mental health condition. They break up their story into sections, starting with dark days, acceptance, treatment, coping skills, and successes, hopes, and dreams. We'll have a time at the end. We'll be taking questions as well. But uh, for now, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to our speakers for their introductions, Kimberly Hernandez and Daniel Schumacher. Thank you, Ed. So, um... I'm excited to be here and thank you for inviting me to tell my story. And it's my intention to give you hope and encouragement to anyone who has a mental health struggle or to someone who loves somebody who does. So NAMI OC has been a constant for me in my life um, since April 9th, 2006. Um, and I, in 1984, just to give you a little background, I met and married my husband um, and lived in Mexico. And while we lived in Mexico, we started our family. We returned back to the United States four years later. So almost 38 years ago, we have now five beautiful grandchildren. So the part of my story that still amazes me the most, and I'll talk more about it after our introductions, is that, um, and it also scares me that I don't have children that have a serious mental illness. And it scares me because I know that it's rare in my family. Um, but it is, it's also something that gives me like, I just feel lucky every day um, that somehow that's happened. Um, they're the first generation on my side to um, also my kids earn their bachelor degree right out of high school. Um, and I'm proud to tell you that they were great athletes and they all played division one sports as well. So March of last year marked the day that I'll never forget and one that I could have never dreamed possible in my life. I earned my bachelor's degree in psychology and I'm in the middle of my third semester. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Um, I'm in the middle of my third semester on track to earn my master's degree in social work. So that's a little bit about me. Yeah, thanks Ed for the introduction and Kimberly, it's, you know, 
great to be able to work with other colleagues like you. Um, my name is Daniel Shoemaker. Um, I came into this program in about June of 2018 um, with some issues, obviously, that came up in my life here. But I am the first, just going kind to of give you guys a background, I am the first one in my family to have gone through high school and gone through college and actually gotten a degree and kind of uh, gone up above what you would normally, what most people have been, have done in my family here and kind of laid the groundwork for my future family and, and things along those lines. So um, I really got kind of more in depth with the NAMI organization after going through some of the issues that, that I've gone through that, like Kimberly said, that we'll talk about a little bit later here. Um, but I am very happy that I found this, this resource um, and then able to now be in a part of my life where I can start a family, where I can kind of shoot for the, the stars and, and, and grasp at the dreams that I had in the past, but also give back to those that I know have, are in possibly a position that is not, not the best and, and relate to them and, and hopefully give back and show them that there is, that there is hope. And that, you know, even though in the, in the darkest times that there is, there's a possibility of, of getting out and accomplishing what you want to. So um, I'm really excited to be here and I really appreciate everyone obviously coming here this evening and, and spending some time with us and, and listen to our stories and hopefully you guys can take something from here that, that uh, makes your lives a little bit better and hopefully help others as well. So thank you. So um, thank you, Daniel, so much. Um, so we'll, should I jump right into dark days then? Okay. So the first dark day that I'm going to be talking about happened when I was 17 years old. I had real troubles in learning uh, most of my life. And back in that day, you were just labeled. My label was that I had mental retardation and I would study with kiddos that couldn't read. And so I didn't ever know any different. I just thought, you know, I had trouble in school. So I had not been ever receiving accommodations at that time in my life. And I was a very hard worker because I had to be, <laughs> or I wouldn't even be able to complete assignments. I'd stay after class if necessary. I spent a lot of time in class and I did and um, a lot of time spent with like teachers that really loved me and paid attention to me. And my experience taking tests since I can remember was very stressful ever since I was really little. I would either blank out during a test or I would forget everything I would study that I'd studied over and over and over the night before. Or things would go fuzzy when I'd take the test and then all of a sudden I'd hear a bell. Um, I graduated from high school without ever having taken algebra or any like reading comprehension more than like basic, basic reading about the third grade level. Um, but I was excited to go to college because I was a really good athlete and I was a cheerleader and I made the cheer team. And so the morning that led to my suicide attempt um, began earlier in the morning with my, my routine that I went through, studying and studying and overstudying. And it was biology. I remember it was biology. And I remember feeling a lot of anxiety. I didn't know at the time what, it, what that was, even what that word was. But I remember just not being, knowing that my mind was about to like be fuzzy and not be able to be able to take a test. And I had this reoccurring fear that I was going to be late because that was always my, my fear of being late for something. And so while driving to the test, I just had, was just overcome with just complete anxious fears and beyond rage. And so I had one idea, just slam your foot on the gas. And I did that. And I slammed it and I slammed into the freeway side of the, of the freeway. And I had envisioned doing it before I did it. It wasn't like an accident. I knew I was like, this is it. I'm done. Um, and I remember the EMTs had to remove me from the vehicle. Um, so I had quite a few days after that that I had to recover. And then my most recent dark day, um, which is I'm happy to say almost more than five years ago, I had been using my accommodations now for 10 years because I finally tested at like 40 years old and found out that I just learned differently than everyone else. Um, and it was test day. I was at Saddleback College. My kids had already like gone to college themselves. And um, I had finished my study routine, which still was not a really good study routine. I hadn't really learned yet how to study. I just knew that I needed accommodations and I was getting them. 
So the proctor began reading, um, who wasn't the normal proctor, started beginning to read my accommodations out loud in front of everyone like that was in the lobby area. And I was just really humiliated by that because she would ask me like, are you sure you need headphones? Are you sure you need, um, you know, she'd go through my list of you need someone to like stop the clock if you are overwhelmed and you need to go take a walk and just in front of everyone. So I remember my ears started to heat up and my breathing got really shallow. And then I remember just right before my mind started to freeze up, I just went into like, just follow her to the room mode. Like I knew to just follow her, but don't say anything because I really couldn't talk. So I did, and I sat down in the cubicle and I sat there for two hours. I don't remember anything that happened. The time, the timer clicked, ding, you know, done. And that was the start of like, I went home and I was just numb. And I ended up calling the college uh, mental health clinic. And I just told them, I don't feel right. I don't know what's wrong, but I, I don't feel right. And they, they asked me all the suicide questions and I said, no. I got to the center and um, after a psychiatrist at the, um, actually she was a psychologist at the mental health clinic at the college, um, kind of did like a, just an, a basic intake with me, um, came up with um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And she said I was classic. She recommended, you know, I find a therapist that could do EMDR, so I did. Um, and that changed my life. I finally like had a name. It gave me a lot of relief, I remember. But knowing that, getting that diagnosis and starting my treatment was the last of my dark days. So Daniel, can you go ahead. Thank you, Kimberly. I'm glad you're still here. Um, so my dark days, and I, I will preface this with the fact that my memory is not the best. Um, but my dark days, I believe, started back in high school. And same thing as it sounds like with Kimberly, I didn't really know what it was. For me, it was, I was very, um, very much of a, of a uh, an introvert. I did not like to, to kind of interact with other people. And I, I did through high school, you know, I was actually, I, I did really well in, in academics. I was on sports teams as well. And, you know, um, playing in junior Olympics and things like that. And so it was, it was great. Like it, on the outside, I was this outgoing, you know, happy person, but inside I could feel that there wasn't something quite right. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't understand it. So for me, I, I think it really started right after high school. I, I came out of high school as, as, a, as a higher, you know, ranked in the class and you know, sports and all that stuff. And then was diagnosed with cancer and had to go through chemotherapy. So I came out with what I thought was a bright future and ready to, to hit the road running in college and, and just go for it. And then it was all just essentially taken away from me at that point. So I had to drop out of college. I had to start going through medical treatments and things like that. And kind of at, at that point in time, really for me, I think that was kind of went to the back burner for me because I had other family issues that were going on in that same time frame, And so coming out of the, the chemotherapy and the other issues that, that we were dealing with, I tried to get back on track. And so once I get back into college, my mind was very much, I'm behind schedule. Everyone else, you know, is already now a year, year and a half ahead of me. I need to get back on this, on track and finish and, and get a degree in something. And so I did, and I went back and I got a degree in, in business management. And when I think about it now, when I take a step back, I think that was probably also something that that added to the fuel to the flame for as you know, for what I'm going through or what I did go through during those dark days um and so as time progressed there I essentially started to to kind of bottle up all these feelings and these thoughts and 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 these misunderstandings of what I was going through and so in college, I found a girlfriend. Things were great. You know, I felt like I found that kind of little step that was like, you know, in the right direction. And I was, I was happy. And as time went on, the relationship itself started to kind of fall apart. And 
towards the end of our relationship is really where I started hitting rock bottom. And it wasn't necessarily because of the relationship itself. It was a culmination of, of everything that I had either done or not done to help myself. And on several different occasions, I had had uh, suicide attempts. And part of it was me, I guess, reaching, trying to reach out for, for help, um, but obviously not in the right manner. And I got to a point in time in my life where, as Kimberly mentioned, like I was numb. Nothing, nothing brought me joy. It, the things that in the past that, you know, I would like love going out and working on the car or playing with the dog, like it was everything was just black and gray for me. And so the lowest point I got to was sitting down, kind of writing out a will and everything and just being like, I'm there's nothing left for me here, unfortunately. Like there's, there's just, there is nothing. Um, and luckily before I followed through with my plans, I reached out for help and I was taken, um, I volunteered to go as well to a, to a mental institution in Laguna Beach into a hospital there. And for me, like that was the darkest day, but also the turning point at which things started to change for me. So can really give it back to you. Yeah. Great. So, and I really relate to that too. Um, I, my memory is also really hazy. And as I'm doing more and more therapy, I'm realizing that I have, I've had, my issue wasn't so much suicide. It was also, I have like, I just lose it. I lose it. And then I blank out that I lost it. Like I didn't even know that people have told me things that have happened. And I, that's actually going to be what I talk more about in the future when I talk about dark days, because those are still things that are coming up for me as I do more and more work. Um, so acceptance is like the next topic. And um, I'm still struggling with accepting my diagnosis um, as I finish my third year um, of weekly visits. Now it's actually four years, four years of weekly therapy visits. Um, I'm improving at identifying my triggers that cause my big emotional responses and for me, the hardest part is catching it when it's like a, a four or five. It used to be like seven or eight. So, the, and that was already almost too late, but now I'm catching it at a four or five. And I accept, um, you know, the coping skills. I, I accept that I have to do them. It's not like, oh, I should. No, it's like you have to do them. You just don't even have a choice because that's what's going to have to happen. Um, I also identify and regulate my emotions and um, I state or I risk becoming infuriated again, like I talked about where I just like, it's like a rage thing or it's a just blank out. It's either one, but neither one works. Then I verbally um, assault people. I, my mind shuts down, blanks out. Like I said, I continually accept um, responsibility. So like when my kids have told me things that have upset them when they were little, I continually accept responsibility for the pain I caused my kids. Um, and I love, um, I love each time that I lost my temper and I embarrassed them or humiliated them or verbally abused them. I am still apologizing to them. It's, it never gets old. And they know, I mean, they know that, you know, it wasn't something that I woke up in the morning and said, hey, I'm gonna like really lose it today at my kids. I'm gonna do that. It, it wasn't something I just did. Um, I also accept that um, when I was a little kid, I had to twist things up in my mind to like manage things that were happening in my childhood. Um, I had to twist it up. I had to twist up my mind. Um, but I also realize now it's time to really let my mind untwist uh, because I can manage things now. Um, I can do it. I can manage things that are challenging. I accept that my diagnosis isn't like who I am but more like something that I'm trying to deal with as best as I can. And that's really powerful for me that I say that a lot. That's probably the affirmation I say the most to myself is like, I accept that this is my diagnosis, but it's something that I can handle. So go ahead, Daniel. Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah, and I think a lot of people for doing this for a couple of years now, we all have, we all come to that, that point of acceptance and, um, in, in certain ways, but I feel like a lot of this stuff too is, is very similar. And so like, like Kimberly said, I, I 
once I was in the hospital, I realized that after I was talking to some of the, the other patients that were there and some of the nurses that some of those people confided in me and we were able to have a discussion and a talk and I felt good to be able to be a shoulder for someone else to lean on and to talk to. And so that kind of became that, that turnaround point, that acceptance point in, in my life of this is a problem that I have or an issue that I have, but it's something that I want to learn to manage. And it's something that with enough coping skills, with enough knowledge, with enough tools, enough support, that it's something that, that can be knowledge. And I can be maybe not the person that, uh, you know, we have that, that bright shimmery ideology, you know, of being, but I can be the best that I can be with the tools that I've got. And it was difficult at first um, coming to, to accepting the fact that like, as Kimberly said, like there were coping skills I had to implement into my life that, that helped me with my depression. That if I got to a point where like, I would catch myself before I got so depressed that I wouldn't want to go out. I wouldn't want to do anything. I just want to sit on the couch and stare at a wall and nothing else. Um, and so I would try and push myself to, to do little things like try something for five minutes. You know, if I like it, great. If not, I can move on to something else. At least I tried. But I think some of the, the biggest things that, that I found that were difficult to accept, but also very relieving was number one, I'm probably going to be taking medication for the rest of my life. But in the end, it's like a vitamin that I have to take every morning. So it's, you know, it's something that's going to make me a healthier and better person. But number two, it's something that I know, at least currently with current medical technology is something that I can't cure, but it's something I can manage really well. And there are still going to be days that I have that are going to be dark and down days for no other reason other than the fact that I'm just depressed. Um, but looking at the, the other days of the happier times and the things that I can remember and the things that, you know, actually bring me joy, focusing on those more than on the days that, you know, are the opposite of that have really been ways for me to, to help accept the major depressive disorder that I was diagnosed with uh, about four years ago. So there was a turnaround point. Okay, so now I'll talk about therapy and treatment that's worked for me. Um, I'll probably, just like Daniel said, I'll probably always need therapy and I'm coming to terms with that and treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but I do like find comfort in something a professor jokingly said in one of my classes. He said that he, people that have approach PTSD and really work at PTSD um, eventually get to call the post-traumatic growth disorder. I like that. I just always say it. Um, if there was an easy way to manage my diagnosis without treatment or therapy, believe me, I would have found it. Um, but I did. I couldn't. I didn't. So what I do is EMDR. Uh, that stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's worked to me really well. I've been able to desensitize, dis desensitize difficult memories that I've had in my life um, and experiences that, you know, I kind of blocked out and reprocess new accurate thoughts um, that have begun to stay with me now. I realize how toxic it is to stay up all night. So um, like if I'm having a bad dream or if something woke me up and I don't remember, sometimes I do remember. Um, I just use my meditation and prayer instead of like staying awake. I have to do my meditation and prayer, even if I don't want to, I don't grab my phone. I don't do anything. I just stay there and do my, my meditation. Um, um, I've also done um, some dialectical behavioral therapy in a group setting. And that helped me with my accurate thoughts, um, just develop more accurate thoughts. I've noticed that telling my story forces me to acknowledge myself and my accomplishments, as well as acknowledge my need for staying up with my coping skills. Also, my dog is a service dog and she really helps me calm down. But lately, I feel like I'm her service dog. She's like really needy lately. <laughs> so that's a little bit about my therapy. Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah, and we all, we get to this stage, uh, I've found that a lot of people have different methods of of coping and, and the therapy that we need and so for me i was at one point seeing a psychologist and psychiatrist 
Um, I do constantly see a psychiatrist now, and I'm, I'm going back to seeing a psychologist again. Um, there are times that for kind of my treatment side, uh, I, I teach another class for the NAMI NAMI program called Peer to Peer. And we, we sit down with other peers and we talk about coping strategies and things like that. And one of the best coping strategies that I've gotten from that class was the breathing technique that we use. And so when I find myself getting really frustrated really easily or, or depressed, I, I try to take in a deep breath, hold it, think about it for a couple seconds and then release and, and do it a couple of times if I have to. And those are in the situations that like I'm driving or I'm in a meeting or whatever it happens to be and to kind of compose myself to make sure that it doesn't get the best of me in that specific situation. Um, we've got, I've got that, that type of tool. But surrounding myself by, I, I think, better friends, um, more meaningful friends and more meaningful family members, uh, setting boundaries with even those people as well have been really key tactics for me to, to kind of help my, my depression and, and overthinking of situations, which also leads me into that depressive side of it. Um, but yeah, the, the, the treatment side of it has been, again, like we said, for me, it's been um, talking with people, but also non-medication. And that's something that I don't know where I'd be without today. So. And so um, coping strategies I've worked are, that have, I've used that have worked for me are um, the breathing square. I love the breathing square. Um, causes me to slow down because I, I feel like I'm breathing slow when I'm not sometimes. So the square slows me down. Um, and also the digital, like the infinity sign on my finger because it brings me in like, it makes like that bilateral stimulation. It has me going out of my, you know, back brain. Um, and then um, when I feel triggered, like if I'm in the car, I like, I call my friend, just call, listen to talk radio that calls me down, calms me down if I'm in the car. If I wake up at night and I'm having those um, anxious or persistent like thoughts about things or I'm worried or whatever. Um, again, I told, like I talked about earlier, I use my meditation. Um, also, yeah, I talked about if, if I'm a six, I'm really, really glad that I'm catching my anger really early. I'm able to make insurance calls too without like really freaking out on the people um, from like Anthem, Blue Cross and, and like doctor's office. Like I'm really impressed like the other day because nothing worked out right. They had all my information wrong. And I, and I like for the first time, I told this to my therapist, the first time I did not lose it and like have to go take a time out and relax, take a bath, cry, whatever I had to do. I really was able to get through those calls without like losing at the people at Anthem Blue Cross. Um, and I didn't even get hazy or uncomfortable. It was, it was really amazing. So things are getting better now that I'm using my coping skills. So we'll move on to like successes, hopes and dreams. Um, do you wanna take this one first, Daniel, or do you want me to go into it? No, go ahead. If you'd like to go, okay. go ahead. Okay, good. So I'll, uh, let's see, I feel success for being married for 38 years. Um, and like I said, raising three adult children, five grandkids. I also feel success at becoming a social work intern um, on track to getting my education um, and managing my life with post-traumatic stress disorder. I feel a lot of stress, I mean, um, stress, <laughs> but also success because of that. Um, I hope um, if one person hears my story and identifies the need to seek support from NAMI, and here's my message. I hope they do it because that's the thing that turned my life around. Um, I did it for one of my siblings that actually did commit suicide, but um, that that was where I started my journey for myself as well. Um, I hope that if my grandchildren or my children ever experience a mental health struggle, that they're not afraid to ask for help and find out what works for them in recovery. Um, and stay aware and informed about how to help someone who they love or someone who just they maybe even just know how to help that person because like not knowing what to do when someone's having a mental health crisis is like sometimes makes things worse. Um, 
I like the idea of being a social worker and I know that I'm having fun learning about what works regarding coping skills and breathing and tapping and engaging in art activities and like all the vital steps to developing um, my treatment plan for life. Yeah, and so and those, those are all great successes and hopes and dreams. And so for me, my, my successes, I feel have been getting to the point that I am today of going through the, the struggles that I went through and then making the best of it and, and what I can. Um, I got engaged earlier this this year in January. So that's something that's also, you know, in some of the bad times I didn't think was ever going to happen. So, you know, some of these successes that I've found in, in life of, of being able to, to manage my my depression has has kind of been great. And the hopes that I have are, you know, to be able to help others and, and continue to do what we do here with Kimberly and Edward and, and I and, and so many of our other colleagues are, are able to do on a daily basis of, of being able to spread the word and, and help others. And like Kimberly mentioned, like I, I hope that at some point in time that I can reach one person and save that person's life and, and help them see that you know, there is more than maybe what they, what they currently see in their situation. And so as, as this goes on, like my dreams are that you know, we can continue to do this and we can continue to offer this and I can continue to do this as well and, and hopefully get to a point in my life where we can help more people, so. This is one of my favorite things to do at NAMI. Uh, one of the things that I first got hired, I got to do this every week at um, the Mission Hospital in Laguna Beach. And it's uh, so life affirming and encouraging. And um, thank you, Kimberly and Daniel, for sharing your story. Uh, we still do have some time here. So we can, um, if there's any questions, there's a Q&A button that you can uh, type in your question. And uh, if we need more clarity, we can unmute and uh, get some clarity, but um, go ahead and type in your question if you have one. Um, I see, let's see. Um, okay, got it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, Ellen uh, just asked a question. She thought this was a training for Inner Own Voice, which is something that we do offer. So, um, you know, Daniel and Kimberly were both trained to be Inner Own Voice speakers. That is something that we do on, um, it doesn't happen very often, but when we do announce it, we do kind of do a, a, an email blast to let people know in our network that we're doing training. So it does require, I don't know, can you, maybe that's, that's one thing we can start off. How was your training? If for people that are expecting, maybe that this is something they want to do, what, what are the expectations for the, the training since you both um, did it? Okay. So for, for my training in, the, in our own voice, specific training here was, uh, it was a two-day, eight-hour program, if I'm not mistaken, on, on a weekend um, where we sat down with a, a registered trainer from NAMI, um, and he walked us through basically all of this, everything that we've talked about, the, the different steps that we go through, uh, as we just did in this presentation here, um, and then gives us time to practice and, and really kind of get in the situation. And we actually do a presentation in that day as well. So we get a chance to kind of refine our stories um, know what we can talk about, what we can't talk about, and make sure we provide as much information as possible without being, without providing too much and, and you know, extending our stories out far past the, the, the lot of time that we typically have in these situations. So I would just add to um, that it's very, um, it's really beneficial to do, especially if you're not somebody that's like aware, like kind of what Daniel was talking about, because it's also something that that has helped me a lot to do. So I, I really recommend doing it, too. Yeah, there actually is, if anybody's interested in uh, leading a peer led support group in Orange County, um, you can email me at eportillo at namioc.org. That's eportillo. My name's right there next to my on the bottom left, P-O-R-T-I-L-L-O -L at namioc.org. And um, I can connect you to a training that's gonna go on with one of our affiliates in Santa Cruz. They are still doing a training for peer-led support. It's called NAMI Connections. 
So um, that's something that we are offering. But once we do an inner own voice training, we'll definitely um, keep that, uh, let everybody know about that as well. Yes, Alan says uh, she is ready. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Alan. Is there any other questions that people have? You can type it into the Q&A. I see that there is a hand raised, Alicia Draper. Um, I'm not sure if that is a question that you have or, okay, let's see. Oh, it is, it is raised. Let me see, there's a question here. Oh, okay. Ellen would be, um, so I'll send you, Ellen, you're interested in the peer support training. So let me um, just put your, your, you can email me that, your email, and I will, um, I will get that to you. So let's see here. Is there another question I see? There we go. All right. We, yeah, we're here till, scheduled till six, but you know, oh, got it. You sent me your email, Ellen. Okay. All right, are there any programs in the group setting in Mission Hospital Laguna Beach? Um, for NAMI, not at, not not any time soon as we, um, we're not sure, they haven't reached out to us about coming back. I mean, we're still kind of uh, seeing where everything goes with COVID. So, um, but as far as the behavioral health unit, I mean, it is, it is from what I, in my experience, it's a great, um, great unit, great staff, and um, I would recommend it for sure to get connected there. Yeah. Okay, Alicia, I think, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and unmute you and you can uh, ask your question. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, I didn't have a question. I'm not sure why it said the hand was raised, but I was just listening. Okay, got it. All right. Okay, well, this is still all the hands there. All right. Um, okay, yes. Questions about Mission Hospital, great place. Thank you, Alan, for your email. All right. Yeah, in the last moments here, we, we if there's any other questions, we always uh, wanna make sure if anybody has any questions, oftentimes parents will check in on this because Maybe they're in a similar situation with their family member, um, individuals that are peers. Let's see here. Um, what kind of program is at Mission Hospital? So I would go to their website, Mission Hospital. Let's see, you could probably search for Mission Hospital Laguna Beach. Um, I know they have a behavioral unit. So part of, um, if you can get in, admitted there, they, they do have a behavioral unit. It's, it's similar, it's, they're a part of the hospital system that's also Mission Viejo. There's another Mission Hospital and Mission Viejo is much bigger. And they also have a behavioral unit as well. But um, uh, the one that I'm familiar with is in Mission Hospital. So you, you can go ahead and look that up. Um, so yes, okay, Sita wants to ask a question. Let's see, let's unmute you, let's see here. Uh, yes, let's see. Are you there? No, what happened? I'm here. Uh, hello, Kimberly and Daniel and Edward. Um, thank you so much for sharing your stories. It was very heartwarming. I'm here for my uh, son who was uh, diagnosed with the condition and uh, he does take medications and he's very, um, like, uh, he's very regular sticks to what all the doctors and therapists say. But the question I want to ask you is, like, um, we all have, have our unique journeys, unique personalities, everything. Uh, when I see him, like, um, taking his medications, everything, uh, sometimes the setbacks are severe. But at what point do we start identifying with our journeys and owning it? Like, medication alone or breathing alone may not or may be the solution. But once when we start owning it and when does that happen is it unique individual or how does that transition happen from your own journeys would you be willing to share that yeah you want to go Kimberly okay all right so I from my experience personally and as well as as doing the classes I've done is it, it's it is individual 
Mm -hmm. um, everyone, as you just said, and, and, and you're correct, like we all react differently to medication. We act differently to treatments that we go through and we all process this, these feelings and these thoughts and these, these emotions um, differently. And so for, for some of us, it comes relatively quickly for others. It takes a long time. Um, for myself, what I've noticed is that it's, it's not just a one way path that once you accept it, and once you understand it, that you just continue to move forward, that there are, there are dips and there will be setbacks and things like that. Um, we just get better at managing that. Um, but that's, that's from my personal experience, um, dealing with, with major depressive disorder. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Dennis. Thank you, Sita. That's, appreciate that. Um, let's see. Okay, Rex has his hand up. So let's see, we can allow you to talk, Rex. You can unmute yourself. Rex, are you there? I was hearing some 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 feedback. Yeah, lower your yeah, you gotta lower your yeah. Let's see if you can lower your um, microphone or your computer audio. Let me see. Want to try that again? You gotta mute yourself now. Oh. Okay. Okay. There we go. Oh, geez, it's doing it again. You know, I'm sorry. Let me. Can I join with uh, my computer audio? Because I'm, I'm, I'm talking on the phone. Sure. Okay. All right. Is is your is your computer audio the three one zero number? Is that your um, login? Yeah. So, yeah. He's on Zoom twice. That's right. That's why. There is a okay, or you can type the question. It might be a little easier if you can type the question, Rex. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, first of all, I just want to say thank you uh, for all of you to to be doing this. Um, I was diagnosed with a dual diagnosis with bipolar, and I have addiction issues. Um, will you? Uh, is it this um, all about major uh, depression? Uh, depression or? Uh, will you be speaking about that as well, uh, about like bipolar disorder and other mental health issues? Well, what's great about, about In Our Own Voice is we have um, speakers that are trained with the various amount of diagnosis. So the next month we'll have two speakers and they'll share their diagnosis and their journey. Okay. Um, we are going to have next month a presentation from Phoenix House. We're mm -hmm. going to have their um, lead, uh, I think that one, of the, one of their lead um licensed marriage and family therapist to talk about the correlation of mental health and substance abuse. Okay. And then we also are going to have that in May as well. We're going to have a, a professor from UCI talk about psychosis and the linking of psychosis and, and uh, um, substance abuse. And so, yeah, we will touch on, on that, but it's specifically bipolar. It really kind of depends on, on the the in our own voice presenters that are here. So, okay. Uh, but we, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it, I know there's a lot of com, uh, comorbidity with um, a lot of these disorders. And so, yeah, bipolar kind of encompasses like depression, uh, mania, uh, psychosis. I'm taking an antipsychosis medication right now for bipolar. But um, yeah, that, I do look forward to, to next month if um, that's the case. Absolutely. And I, I would recommend um, checking the the peer to peer class. Okay. We actually just Daniel will be teaching the next class. It's going to be launching. I think we just discussed it on the twenty third of March at six yeah. p.m. So if you go to our website, namioc.org, and you click on the classes button, you can submit your information, and we can get in touch with you if that works with you for um, March twenty third at six p.m. There are ten week classes, two hours each. And they're specifically geared for individuals that have a diagnosis. So, um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, and you just, mentioned it was March twenty third at six p.m. And how how long was that? Or uh, two hours. So each class is two hours, and it goes for ten weeks. For ten consecutively. Weeks. Okay. Would uh, we be able to speak at those meetings? Or yeah, uh, they're actually meet, they're actually meetings um, where you'll see everybody's faces and you'll be able to talk. 
That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah, but it is, but, but it is a, a curriculum curriculum based and it's led by a curriculum. So you, it's not like a support group where you go and just kind of share for the two hours. It's going to be very intentional, but there is opportunities to share and there's opportunities to engage with the content with the teachers. Got it. Got it. So it's more like a, a instructional, like a, like a class type setting. Right. right. And then one of the things I think Kimberly or Daniel mentioned it, that one of the things you do go through is a, uh, uh, a sheet that locks in all your uh, triggers that lead to an episode. Right. That really helps kind of see why it put things in a lot of perspective. That's one of the tools as well as coping skills and a lot of other subjects that cover. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I've, I've kind of just taken it upon myself to document all my triggers as they come up. And then I find it, I'm documenting like seven pages worth and it just keeps adding and adding. And <laughs> I know I can condense it and the kind of groups them together as the same trigger, but yeah, once I get on it and I'm feeling low, then everything is a trigger basically. So yeah, I'm hoping to, to manage that. Great. Yeah. I would definitely, definitely uh, encourage you to, to check that out. So thanks Rex. Appreciate okay, it. well, thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And uh, and with that, yeah, we are going to have an in our own voice presentation on, it looks like on the 18th of April. So it looks like next month we'll have it on the 18th of April. And then we also have one in May that we have scheduled. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> not April. <laughs> We're going to have one on um the 24th of March and then the 18th of April as well. So the 24th of March will be our next in our voice presentation. And again, the 23rd of, um, which is a Wednesday will be our launch of our peer to peer class. So go to our website, namioc.org for that. You can also call our warm line. It's 714-991-6412. That's 714-991-6412. That's our 24 hour resource and support line. So if you need somebody to talk to, or if you're looking for resources in Orange County, please reach out to our warm line at 714-991-6412. And uh, we appreciate everyone attending and we hope to see you on the next one. And thank you again for Kimberly and Daniel for sharing your story. And I uh, hope you all have a great night. See you later. Bye now.